In this lecture, I'm going to discuss model analysis of multi-degree of freedom systems. So first of all, what is a multi-degree of freedom system versus a single degree of freedom system? Well, a single degree of freedom system is a system in which the complete response of the structure can be determined by the response of a single coordinate. And that coordinate doesn't necessarily have to be a physical coordinate, but it usually is. So think about a cantilever beam with a mass attached at the end. And, and assume that this uh, cantilever has no mass along the length. The mass is completely concentrated at the end that's a single degree of freedom system because if you know the dynamic response of this point you can determine the dynamic response of the complete length of the cantilever or any other system like that so you could even have let's say something like this a frame two-story frame with no mass except a mass here at the top, if you know the response of that coordinate, you can infer the response of the rest of the structure by just knowing the stiffness matrix, right? So these are all examples of single degree of freedom system. I mean, the most simple ones, right, are like a spring and mass, but it doesn't have to be a spring and mass. It could be any of these other examples in which knowing the dynamic response of one coordinate determines the complete dynamic response of the rest of the system. On the other hand, multi-degree of freedom systems are systems in which the opposite happens. You, you need to know more than one coordinate. So you can imagine a cantilever beam with multiple masses here. In this case, if you just know the response of one coordinate, you cannot determine the response of the whole system because the dynamics are affected by the response of all the systems interconnected, right? Same thing with something like a frame like this with um, multiple floors, with multiple masses you have to know the core the response of three coordinates here to obtain the complete dynamic response because the dynamics are interconnected by the stiffness matrix you can't just inter extrapolate from one response you have multiple masses connected by springs similar situation <coughs> so you know, one way to think about it is that if you have a system with multiple distributed masses, you have a single degree, a multi-degree of freedom system. Now, that's one way to think about it, but it's not the most general way to think about it, because you could have a system with distributed masses and still consider it as a single degree of freedom system if you assume a certain type of displaced shape. And we're going to talk about that later on. That's kind of part of the basis of, of modal analysis in, in a sense. Okay, so let's start with the equation of motion for a multi-degree of freedom system with no damping you would start with something like this right the mass matrix times the vector of accelerations plus the stiffness matrix times the displacement vector equal to zero so we're in a case of free vibration no forcing term on the right hand side the solution to this equation <coughs> could be something like this. If we look at the displacement vector here, 
equal to a shape which we're gonna call phi. So phi is a sh is a shape in space times a sign going at a certain frequency, right? Circular frequency. If that's the case, we take two derivatives and we find that the acceleration vector will be minus phi omega squared sine of omega t. And if we put that into our original equation, we arrive at this bottom equation right here. Minus m phi omega squared plus k phi, all of that multiplied times sine omega t equals to zero. Now this has to be true for all times since sine of omega t is not zero for all times, in order for this solution to be true, the following equation needs to be true. And this is the key equation for uh, modal analysis of undamped systems. m phi omega squared equals k phi. So whatever that shape is that we picked and that frequency, they have to satisfy this equation right here. So if we can show that this equation can be satisfied and it's true, <coughs> then the solution for the displacement of the structure in free vibration could have this shape right here, which is basically a shape in space which is independent of the vibration in time. The shape or phi we call mo shape and omega is a circular frequency. Now for that equation to be true, we basically we will show that it constitutes a classical eigenvalue problem. So if we substitute omega squared by lambda, it's just a constant, then we multiply by the inverse of the mass matrix and we arrive at phi times lambda equals to m to the minus 1, k phi. If you notice, that looks exactly the same in the same form as the classical eigenvalue problem, a phi equals to phi lambda, where a is a matrix, phi is a vector, and lambda is a scalar. Just to remind you a little bit about the standard eigenvalue problem, so if you have a matrix, a, and you multiply it by any vector, x, let's say, you're going to get another vector, which is a times x. And that vector will differ from x in two ways. It will be aligned along a different direction, and it will have a different magnitude than x. However, there are some special vectors that we're going to call phi, that if you multiply a matrix by these phi's, the matrix now behaves like a scalar because when you multiply the matrix times these special vectors phi, the only thing that happens to phi is that phi gets either longer or shorter, but it doesn't change directions, which is exactly what would happen if you multiply the phi by a scalar. In this case the scalar is lambda, which is what we call the eigenvalue. So these special vectors phi are called eigenvectors and these scalars, lambdas, are called eigenvalues. And these are extremely important for many, many applications. I'm sure you've seen this eigenvalue problem before, and we're going to see how it relates to structural dynamics now, right? So, uh, as we said before, this problem here can be recast as a classic eigenvalue problem. And then the question is, how many lambdas are there, right? How many of these special vectors exist? Well, m and k 
are both symmetric matrices by definition and they are of size n by n where n is the number of degrees of freedom and in if we if we look at our um, eigenvalue problem here and we simply bring m times lambda to the right hand side and we group terms we find out that k minus m phi parentheses times lambda times uh, phi I'm sorry equals to zero since phi is not zero obviously then this has to be zero well or since this is obviously not zero this is k minus m phi the other option is that this matrix here k minus phi lambda lies in such a way that phi times this matrix is zero if phi is not zero that basically means that k minus phi lambda is not invertible You, c you can't invert it, because if you could invert it, then you would be multiplying a matrix times zero and obtaining a vector phi. That's impossible. So basically, lambdas are such that they make k minus m times lambda not invertible, which in, in uh, linear algebra terminology, it's called singular, right? That matrix is singular which basically means that its determinant is equal to zero. So the determinant of a matrix that is not invertible is equal to zero. When we calculate the determinant of this, we find a polynomial of degree n. Remember, n is the number of degrees of freedom, and we know from a basic theorem of algebra that it will have n roots. And each one of those roots is a solution for lambda. So the, this polynomial that results from taking the determinant of this matrix is called a characteristic polynomial. And the roots of those polynomials are the lambdas. Roots equal to lambdas. And so from that we know that there are n lambdas. So basically there are n eigenvalues 